So hi, I'm Charlie Rice from the Chrome security team, and I'm going to be talking today about our launch of site isolation uh, in the Chrome web browser to better align the browser's security model with OS process boundaries. And our goal in this work was really to provide a second line of defense against vulnerabilities in the rendering engine, uh, which were common and something that we were concerned about, leaking cross-site data to website attackers. But it turned out that this was also important work for defending against specter and transient execution attacks, which also work within the browser. So I'll talk about how we shipped site isolation to all Chrome desktop users, that's on Windows, Mac, Linux, and Chrome OS, as a mitigation for these types of attacks. To do this, we needed to overcome many challenges beyond prior research browsers, like Gazelle and OP, to make this practical to deploy. In particular, we had to make trade-offs to support compatibility with the full web platform to launch this in an actual browser, and to make it performant enough to, for uh, launching. As a result, there were some limitations in the security protections. But we find that we have opportunities to improve those, and that I'll show that this offers the best path to protection against these types of attacks. So the motivation for this work really goes back about a decade uh, to when we were first making web browsers multi-process and splitting out the browser process into a privileged process and a separate sandbox renderer process where we could put most of the attack surface. The goal here, of course, was to make it so that even if an attacker has a security bug in the browser that they know about, it's hard to get out of the sandbox and install malware or get access to local resources. Now, we knew even then that we wanted to do more than that, that there's a lot of sensitive data that can still be within that renderer process. Uh, that we want to protect. And in particular, it's very easy for an attacker's website to get victim data into the same process. They can load a cross-site iframe or a pop-up to bring potentially credentialed information into the same renderer process. So we wanted to provide a second line of defense against those types of attacks. So in our work, we were trying to defend against two new attacker types. Uh, the first is a render exploit attacker that knows of a bug in the browser and wants to get access to this cross-site data. So this type of attacker is very powerful. They can basically run arbitrary code within the renderer process. They can send spoofed IPC messages to the browser process to lie and try and ask for more data. And they want access to uh, the user's other accounts on different websites and so on. So we want a second line of defense against this type of attacker. But there's a second type of attacker that proved relevant as well. And when Spectre and other transient execution attacks uh, came out, we found out that these also work from JavaScript code or WebAssembly code that can run within the browser itself. And so you can basically run uh, side channel attacks on CPU state uh, within the renderer process and use that to access memory addresses within the process. And that may include data like things that are in cross-site iframes or other pages in the renderer, arbitrary data in there. Now, this is a qualitatively different attacker than the render exploit one. It's not as powerful. You can't run arbitrary code, and you can't send IPC messages that lie to the browser process. But it is one that doesn't depend on any bugs in the browser. That you can have a completely correct implementation, and this attack will still be possible and put the uh, same origin policy at risk. So it's very important to have an effective mitigation for both types of attacker. So site isolation is an architecture that tries to make it possible to mitigate both types of attacker by putting data that's worth stealing out of reach. At a high level, the architecture consists of two main concepts. Uh, one is providing renderer processes that can be dedicated to a single site principle. So all the documents and workers within that process are limited to that particular site, even in the case of things like iframes. And second, filtering what sort of information is allowed into that process, especially from the network. Uh, and this is challenging for compatibility reasons because web pages can access lots of cross-site data. So I'll go into just parts of this architecture uh, to give you a sense for what was involved. Uh, Out-of-process iframes was one of the largest amounts of effort that went into this project. Um, to put this in context, you can think about the move to a multi-process browser as basically taking an existing off-the-shelf rendering engine, which is WebKit in our case, and more or less running multiple copies of it side by side in different tabs. Uh, there were more changes needed than just that, but it wasn't too disruptive. 
For auto-process iframes, it's a very different story. You basically have to decompose everything in the rendering engine to work at a frame granularity. And this means that paints need to be composited across multiple processes. You need to know where to send input events. You need representations of frames that live in other processes. You can send messages to them. And then there's an enormous long tail of features that all assumed that the, uh, all the frames of a page were in one process. So things like find in page, where you're just searching for a string in the DOM, suddenly now become effectively a distributed system where you're collecting partial results and they may come back slowly or in a different order or not at all, and you can't leak results to other processes. So there were a lot of changes we needed to make to support the entire web platform and all the features that were involved. So this was probably the bulk of the work and most of the over 400,000 lines of code that we needed to update to make site isolation possible. But we faced different types of compatibility challenges as well. So for filtering data out of the renderer process, uh, we have something called cross-origin read blocking that we need to allow through images, JavaScript files, CSS from any website because that's allowed by the web platform. But we don't want a, an attacker to say, oh, I'm asking for this image, which is actually a secret HTML file from another website, and have that come into the render. It wouldn't render as an image, but you'd still have access to it from a specter attack or from a render exploit. So we can look at types like HTML and XML and JSON that are most likely to have sensitive data in them and that won't work in these sub-resource types and try and keep them out of the process. But to do this in a compatible way, we have to deal with a lot of the mess that's out there on the web as well. If you just looked at content type, you'd end up blocking a lot of legitimate JavaScript files that just happen to be labeled as text HTML. And we want to block HTML files, so, but we can't block that file. We can't use just off-the-shelf content sniffing either because something that starts with an HTML comment and might look like HTML is actually valid for the JavaScript engine as well. So we have to use uh, custom sniffing logic to confirm that something is actually HTML, XML, or JSON before we block it. Now we've done a lot of work to try and protect as much as possible uh, while still preserving compatibility. So having dedicated processes in this sort of filtering is sufficient to deal with the memory disclosure attackers where you can't lie to the browser process. But for render exploits, you also need to catch malicious IPC messages uh, which might be asking for more data than that render process is allowed to access. So we have uh, a notion in the browser process of what site a process is locked to, and if we see it asking for uh, things from other sites that's not allowed to, we know that normally the security checks within the render would have caught that, but we can have a second line of defense there and terminate a misbehaving render process before it does anything more. So to evaluate how well this architecture uh, can be deployed and used against these attacks, we wanted to look at what sort of coverage it provides and what limitations it faces, how we can address those limitations, and how practical is this to deploy to actual users. So for render exploits, uh, I first want to call out that this is a problem that matters in practice. Uh, that we looked at uh, universal cross-site scripting like bugs, uh, which are high severity bugs that allow one website to access data from other websites. From 2014 to 2018, we had 94 of these in Chrome over that period. So that's about 20 a year, which is something that we really want to have a second line of defense against. In terms of the coverage that we're getting from this, we looked at it from the perspective of a web developer who in the past had to throw up their arms against any attacker that had a bug in the browser. That if they could exploit the rendering engine, then any sort of authentication or crossword in messaging just had no guarantees before. And they've just been transparently upgraded to be robust against those attackers for things like authentication with cookies and saved passwords, confidential data that's protected by crossword and read blocking. Uh, we can verify the source and target origins of post message, uh, and a click jacking like XFrame options and CSP frame ancestors and use of storage and permissions. These are all things that the browser process can now enforce, even in the presence of a compromised render. So we're really excited about these sort of defenses that are now available to websites. On the transient execution attack side, uh, we want to compare against other mitigation strategies that uh, were considered by browsers. So when these were first disclosed, browsers started by removing precise timers from the platform. They're trying to make things like performance.now less granular, and removing features that could be used as 
uh, implicit timers like shared array buffer. Unfortunately, this proved not to be effective against the attacks. We saw many proofs of concept where even extremely coarse timers could be amplified to uh, still perform the attack just at a, a slightly reduced bandwidth. And at the same time, this sort of change to the web platform is harmful to web developers, that they want to use precise timers, they want to use features like shared array buffers and web assembly threads to build powerful applications. So we don't view this as a good long-term mitigation to this sort of attack. Second, browser vendors looked at doing compiler and runtime mitigations for uh, transient execution attacks to basically say, maybe we'll make it hard to express this attack and to have the JavaScript, uh, the JIT compiler output the patterns of code necessary to do this attack. Uh, this unfortunately turned out to not be effective either. There are a lot of variants of transient execution attacks that are very difficult to mitigate in this way, such as Spectre Variant 4 with store to load forwarding. Uh, there's a great paper by the V8 team called Spectre is Here to Stay, which explains this in a much deeper sense uh, of why we don't think this is a practical way forward. So that leaves a strategy of trying to keep the data out of reach of an attacker, which is what we were trying to do with site isolation anyway. So this is effective against same process variants for data that we can keep out of the process. It's worth noting that transient execution attacks can sometimes have cross-process or kernel implications. And for that, we need to combine with OS and hardware level mitigations to protect those cases. But it is still important to have something like site isolation for the same process variant because OS and hardware don't have any visibility into the abstractions within a browser about where the security domains are. So you really need both of these types of mitigations. So that brings me to some of the limitations that we needed uh, to address. So one, I've been talking about sites here as a definition which is actually a little more coarse than the origins that are used in the same origin policy. So a site is a scheme plus basically a registered domain name uh, rather than a full scheme, host, and port. So it would be something like HTTPS, Google.com. And this is due to features on the web like document.domain where web pages can change their origin at runtime within the boundary of a site. Uh, this is a feature that we would love to deprecate from the web if we can move enough websites in that direction. Uh, in the meantime, we're trying to provide opt-in origin level isolation for sites that don't want to use this document.domain feature and that want to isolate a particular origin from the rest of their site. Second, there are many types of data that, that are not yet protected by CORB and that we want to keep out of the renderer process. Uh, so we have a few directions forward here. Uh, one, there is a opt-in header that sites can adopt on any type of data uh, called cross-origin resource policy. And we're also working to add more types of CORB protected types to the browser. For example, we've also included PDFs and zips and other uh, file formats uh, to try and protect them so that web developers don't have to do any work. But ultimately, we're looking more towards ecosystem level changes where we make things like uh, same site cookies the default. And that'll make it much more difficult for an attacker's web page to pull in non-public data into that process uh, unless they use something like cores to use credentials. So we're, we're hopeful for that being a good mechanism towards keeping sensitive data out of a renderer process. I mentioned cross-process transient execution attacks and things that might target the kernel. These are things like microarchitectural data sampling, or you may know as fallout and things like that, where another uh, hyper-thread on the same core might be targeted. Uh, and in these cases, we need to combine with OS and hardware level mitigations uh, to ensure that we have protection against these attacks. And finally, this is a launch that we did on Chrome desktop platforms. Uh, we haven't yet launched it on Android or on mobile devices. So we are doing work here to try and uh, deal with the other types of workloads that we face on those devices to be able to isolate a subset of sites on Android. In terms of practicality on desktop, we had a lot of concerns about the impact that this would have. Then when we looked at how many renderer processes Chrome users have in the wild, at the 99th percentile without site isolation, they already have 35 processes in Chrome. With a naive implementation of site isolation, that could have driven that up to about 80 processes uh, based on the number of tabs and the number of sites that users had on those tabs. So 
we were able to do a number of performance optimizations and process consolidation things where in same site cases, we can reuse existing processes while preserving responsiveness and bring that 80 down to 53 processes at the 99th percentile. Now, that's still a fairly large increase in the number of render processes. But we were happy to see that this did not have a significant impact on the total memory use of the browser. That these render processes, we have more of them, but they are smaller, shorter lived, and less fragmented now. And the total memory overhead ended up being only 13% at low percentiles and 9% at high percentiles. So we were really pleasantly surprised with our ability to ship this to all users. So as a result, uh, combining with some of the optimizations we did for navigation and input event latency, uh, we really saw improved performance there. And in fact, in many cases, we saw benefits from the parallelism, splitting up pages and having the mainframe become more responsive. So in conclusion, this uh, defense that we set out to build as a second line of defense for render exploits also proved to be very important for transient execution attacks, which really pose a new threat in the web, threat in the web security model because they don't require any bugs in the browser. We find that site isolation offers the best path to protection against these in the browser by not leaking data to these types of attackers. We found it was practical to deploy this to all Chrome desktop users, and we are making progress on protecting more types of data with this architecture. Finally, it's worth noting that this type of architecture change might be something that other systems need to consider if they run untrustworthy code within the same process as sensitive data. That we really are facing a different set of threats now and it's worth addressing them at the architecture level. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Tali. You have a few minutes for questions. Hi, this is Antoine Delinia from MSR. Um, I didn't understand your talk, um, uh, how you actually perform the check for your cross-origin data? Is it done inside the render process, or is it done outside? Ah, good question, yes. So that needs to be done in the privileged process outside of the sandbox. Uh -huh. And for, in our case, we have a uh, network service process that can watch the responses coming in and look at things like the content type and what's in the response before allowing it into the renderer process. Uh, OK, thank you. Yep. Hi, my name is uh, Bobo from Facebook. Great talk. Thank you so much for it. I was wondering if you could talk more about the performance improvements that you made while you were optimizing for practical deployability and what kinds of, uh, and you mentioned a lot of different features that web developers might want to use, including WebAssembly and other more powerful things. I'm curious where you were getting the performance wins that you optimized for with the parallelism. Sure, so the, um, the performance wins that we saw within the browser uh, were often in cases where a, a page had cross-site iframes, maybe there were ads or things that might slow down the responsiveness of the, the top level page. Uh, the other optimizations that we added within the, the browser to make this feasible to deploy, uh, there's many in the paper, but one example is having a spare renderer process that we carefully manage and uh, stop using as memory overhead gets high, but it means that there's less latency on a cross-process navigation, which is much more common in this architecture. Very cool, thanks. thanks. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. I'm Jitin from IIT Madras. So uh, if there's a web page that is uh, wantingly asking for multiple origins, uh, something like a, a, a DDoS, where it, it's trying to impact your performance by requesting multiple origins, will it affect the performance badly? Uh, yes, yeah, so pages could try to have many different cross-site iframes across many sites to cr uh, create a lot of processes. So. We want to have defenses in place to uh, limit the number. And we have some limits in place for the number of iframes that are allowed on a page. We can certainly do that for a number of processes and so on. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's thank Charlie again. Thanks. Thanks.